This is Berkeley up in the right. I think it's safe to say he was a pioneer of computer, computer science long before it was called that. Um, he died back in 88, uh, born early 20th century, and he was a co-founder of the ACM, one might say the primary co-founder of it. And that story's part of this story, so very much into the computer science. He wrote a book called Giant Brains, and that book in 1949 talked about what was then the first Boolean algebra-based computer based on a paper that had come from a master's thesis written by Claude Shannon. And that's the main story of this, is there's kind of a mythology that Shannon wrote this wonderful paper, everybody immediately adopted it, and they fundamentally changed computers from then on. It took about a decade for that to happen, and Berkeley was one of the main reasons it's happened. This is the machine I'll talk about. Um, Berkeley was also a teacher and trying to spread the word on computers back in their early days, and this was arguably the first electronic game system that was affordable and sold, and also arguably the first laptop computer that people bought. This is 1955, keep in mind. And while that's viewed somewhat cynically by a lot of computer scientists who consider this a toy, I think there's a lot of evidence that it was more than that. So, on with the story. And the slides do tend to be kind of dense because my memory is not what it once was. And this helps me to cite at least some of the key facts when my memory doesn't remind me of it. Main point is he went to Harvard in the 1920s and there he went to a class on symbolic logic taught by George Burkhoff, not Garrett, who's his son, and much more famous in recent times. But it was George who was the prover, along with Ken Sheen, of the ergodic theorem. So he was both involved in probability and in symbolic logic, which was an interesting uh, combination. And he recommended that Berkeley read Bull's book. And Berkeley was blown away by it because he thought this was a mathematical theory of logic and hence could improve the way people thought about everything not just mathematics, but politics and social studies and everything. He got his bachelor's in 1930 and he gave a graduation talk on modern methods of thinking, basically giving all of his uh, enthusiastic predictions about how important this stuff would be if only everybody learned it. He wanted to be a pure mathematician. That was the life that seemed to, be, to him to be the perfect life, but it was 1930. So his parents warned him that they were in the Great Recession. He better get a job. So he went to work in the actuarial department of an insurance company instead and moved to New York City. Shannon's a little younger. He entered here in 1932. So you've probably heard a bit more about him than Edmund Berkeley. He also discovered George Boole in a, in a um, classroom and graduated in 36 with degrees in EE and math. Shortly after that, Berkeley moved to Prudential Insurance. And if you know, if you know a little history of computer science, you know that the insurance industry was very important in its founding because they had all of these numbers to crunch to determine all of the statistics of millions, tens of millions of insurance policies. And it was costly to have people do all of that. So much of it was done by punch card machines. Um, this though is before IBM takes over that industry. It moves in, provides credentials, its uh, computers, but it's about that time. And he kept on his college interest of looking into Boolean algebra because it seemed to him Boolean algebra ought to help design these punch card machines and make them smarter, able to do more stuff, not just compute the numbers, but to test policies for validity and to make decisions. So that was his long-term goal, which began in the mid-30s, verifying contract clauses. Um, and you'll notice I have a lot of comments in red. 
that's on purpose, you'll hopefully cluster them in your mind as you go on, and you'll probably see the common uh, thread, which is another one of the substories of Berkeley. Part of his honeymoon was he went to the Soviet Union, spent a few months there with his wife, took classes at a, an English institute uh, associated, I think, with the University of Moscow, and he also lived in the Knickerbal Knickerbocker village in Manhattan. Anyone ever heard of that? All right, suffice it to say that this was a group of people with common interests, which were mostly on the left side of the political spectrum. And so if you lived there and participated, you started getting onto all kinds of lists that were kind of dangerous for your future. So this, you can see where this is leading. In 1936, he worked with Anavar Bush on the differential, pardon me, he, we now have to switch he's, Shannon, was at MIT and worked on the differential analyzer with Vannevar Bush and started to realize that his knowledge of Boolean algebra ought to help design machines which do numerical stuff. Now, this was purely an analog machine, so Boolean algebra wasn't really a big help at that, but he was also writing a master's thesis. And so in his master's thesis, which will get published in 1938, he pursues his interests of looking at Boolean algebra not to general computing, but specifically to relay and switching circuits that are useful in telephone networks. So I've got a couple of quotations here. The first one is kind of long, but I like it because it's from Martin Gardner. And I remember reading Martin Gardner in Scientific American for years and years and learning about puzzles and some about logic. And he also wrote books about symbolic logic and he also wrote a lot of reviews. And this does a very nice job of relating Boolean algebra, propositional calculus, symbolic logic. They're not exactly the same thing, but they're essentially isomorphic. So they all relate to each other and associating true and false values in logic with binary zero and one, which correspond to circuits, relays, um, or uh, switches that are either open or shut. And showing that the Boolean algebra, the binary Boolean algebra, could be used to essentially design simple switching circuits and switch simple relay circuits. So that's a good description of what's in here. It's not about general computers, just about these specific applications. But another gardener, not related, but another mathematician, as well as I think a psychologist, happened to make the comment that I've heard quoted lots, which is probably true, it was the most important MS thesis of the century. So the top paragraph you don't have to read, it's stuck in just to make the point that there were others working on similar ideas. Shannon wasn't the first, but he was certainly the first to get known, partially thanks to Berkeley. He was the first to publish in English. The others were Russians and Japanese who were working in these areas, and all of their work was independent. And certainly if you look at numbers of citations, Shannon is way beyond anybody else. So, and I, I think there's, there's reason to give him the biggest dose of the credit for this paper. And I've already said the other comment. So this was the main point, which I've heard some speakers lauding Shannon just getting it wrong. Nothing much was done with his ideas during the 40s, not even at Bell Labs, not even by the people there building computer machines who knew about Shannon's work. It just wasn't taken seriously. That includes, so far as what's been made public since, all the secret computers that were built during World War II. Nobody really cited his paper, nobody really knew much about it. So this is just, uh, I'll occasionally mention papers that Berkeley published, and this is actually in an insurance company, and he's building the case, which improves with time, that they ought to be using Boolean algebra in order to improve their data processing and improve their equipment. 
and he did get recognition for this at Prudential. Um, so people were listening to him there. 1939 was the complex number calculator, which was one of the first big machines. It was developed by a mathematician named George, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Stiebitz or Stibitz. Um, he followed that first machine, which dealt with complex numbers. You may have heard of the Bell Labs girl computers, who were all of the women who were trained to do rapidly numerical calculations. And essentially, this machine was used by them as an aid. When it wasn't something they could do simple, simply, they would type the problem into a teletype. The machine would solve it. It would print out in their teletype, and they would have it that way. Um, he made these two general purpose relay computers in 1946, and they went to a couple of famous places. Langley Field, although then this was a, a National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, not the Spooks, and the Ballistic Research Laboratory, which was in Aberdeen, which always seemed to be at the forefront of the early development of the big machines. Um, he went to a Berkeley, I have to be careful about pronouns, in 1940 went to a public demonstration that was held at Dartmouth of the Bell Machine. And it's sort of an accident that Norbert Wiener's name is in red. It was a quirk of the formatter I couldn't get rid of before I gave this talk. Although it does help remind me that Norbert Wiener plays a role in this talk later on where he doesn't appear where you might think he would. But this was to point out with big guns, John von Neumann and George Burkhoff of Harvard. And they basically gave the problems to somebody who sent them through the telephone lines, which the girl computers relayed into the computer, which produced the answer, which sent it back. So it was not exactly real time, but it was a demonstration of the speed for numerical operations. 1940 was also the year when um, Berkeley met Claude Shannon, and it was done by letter. The introduction was by a famous logician named Alonzo Church, who wrote lots of articles for the Journal of Symbolic Logic and wrote lots of reviews, including reviews of Shannon and Berkeley and other names that will crop up. So we'll see his name on occasion as we go along. 41, as you may know, Shannon joined Bell Labs, and lots of stuff happened. Um, Berkeley continued the correspondence with him. Berkeley actually uh, visited Bell Labs, and he saw the complex number machine. And he had the insight to realize that there was a lot going on with the Bell Labs relay machines and the Prudential insurance punch card machines and tabulators. And that he suspected that the Boolean algebra would be the right way to handle these kinds of machines. They didn't really know programming that much then, but he realized both for the design and for the implementation, Boolean algebra would probably help. Berkeley also took on a mission. You may or may not know that Lewis Carroll was interested, of Alice in Wonderland, was interested in symbolic logic, and he wrote a book to try and popularize it by giving all of the incidents in real life that it might help. Well, his book wasn't all that successful. Most people did not know about symbolic logic, so Berkeley decided he would kind of do indirectly that, but he would do it by popularizing Shannon's work. That is, he would take Shannon's paper for switching circuits and relay circuits and inform the computing and the general public about that paper and how useful it would probably be. So he took on a mission which would involve writing, lecturing, and developing actual machines for teaching. So um, he also invited Shannon and Stibitz to come to Prudential, and they did. And there was actually hope that those two might be involved in consulting to develop a relay machine that would do not just the number crunching, but also the validation and the 
decision processes needed for is ins issuing lots of insurance policies. Unfortunately, um, the Prudential company decided not to proceed with that. I think basically because there was a change of management to somebody who was less sympathetic with, with putting in more research on untried computing methods. And eventually they decided to give it a try, but they did it by ordering a Univac computer. So that name is probably familiar to you. What may not be familiar is that the designers of it, who were very involved with the very first general purpose computer, ENIAC, um, were terrible at meeting deadlines. And they missed them repeatedly. So Prudential eventually went to IBM and another punch card machine. OK, um, Berkeley writes another memorandum. He was doing this constantly. In 42, he joined the Naval Reserve. And 43, 45 was the ENIAC machine. And I never remember their names, so I have to always look at, at I'm not even sure how it's pronounced, Mochley or Moshley, if any of the computer scientists, Mochley, thank you, and Eckert. And ENIAC was a secret war project which became extremely, well, as a working big computer, it was extremely important. 44, Berkeley was assigned to the Harvard Computation Laboratory. This was run by uh, Harold Aiken, and he helped run the Mark I, also called the IBM Automatic Sequence Control Calculator, which IBM had built. They famously had a falling out about credit for the machine somewhat later. Um, Aiken had a reputation as being a lone wolf, which I keep finding little tidbits about. I'll probably try and drop a couple as I go along. He worked with Grace Murray Hopper, who was a, um, an officer in the Navy as well, later Admiral, and he helped design the next machine in the sequence, the Mark II. Uh, he, this is just more of his, uh, well, a lot of the quotes on him, by the way, are he kept extensive memoranda and correspondence and these are all available now on the Charles Babbage Institute, which is um, in Minnesota, at the university thereof, I think. Um, and so a lot of these quotes come from there. I haven't been very careful in itemizing exactly where each comes from, but you can find most of that in Longo's book and in a few of the other papers cited at the end. Um, he, Again, noted the potential of Boolean algebra, symbolic logic, combined with high-speed computers. So it wasn't really Shannon that did that. It was, it was really Berkeley. Um, more red, he starts contributing to progressive causes like Spanish Civil War veterans and um, just things that the government tended to associate with uh, leftist politics. And we'll see more of that later. When he left the military, returned to Prudential, uh, kept working on symbolic logic. He was very prominent in promoting open research in computing machinery because the tendency in the beginning of the Cold War and the post-war time was to classify more things, to keep it more secret, if anything, to discourage open research on computing. And Berkeley and his colleagues um, were trying very hard to keep open communications channels on that research. During 1946, a couple of intrepid Harvard undergraduates were suffering under all of the work solving truth tables in their symbolic logic class. They decided it was way too much work. They were aware of Shannon's paper. And so they spent about 120 bucks. At the time, that wasn't trivial, but it wasn't all that much, and put together what was essentially the first logical, based on Shannon, based on Boolean algebra computing machine, which inherited their name as the Callum Burkhardt Logical Truth Calculator. It had no numerical uh, capabilities. It was able to handle pretty serious logical problems up to many more 
uh, terms than earlier efforts were able to handle. That's a picture of it. It had relays on the underside, and you can see these kind of rotating disks that make connections. You may remember there were rotating disks on the Geniac machine I showed on my first slide, as we'll get back to. But it was fairly complicated, but not too expensive. And I, I love Gardner's quote on it, that this was great historic interest, marked a major turning point in the development of logic machines, but so far no one has been able to find the slightest practical use of it, which is unfair because uh, they had found great use in solving their homework problems. And so it, it had some application, but it was mainly the first computer anybody knows of that was designed based on Shannon's thesis. And it's uh, almost, it's a decade later. Okay, 1947, the first symposium on big computing machines was held at Harvard. And um, it had quite a big attendance. And this publication of it, it i just show a front page and then I'll quote from a, a little bit, was actually published by an organization called the Committee on Mathematical Tables and Other Aids to Computation. Not an actual professional organization. This was essentially an advisory committee to the US government. And they published a journal. They would be one of the ones, along with the AIEE and IRE, the two IEEE ancestors, to complain bitterly when Berkeley proposed a magazine on computing machines claiming they already had that territory. There was no need for somebody else to come in and publish it. And I guess the amusing thing is their journal with that name is now an ACM publication. So it was eventually bought out by the organization whose existence they tried to prevent. Um, this, I'm not sure how readable it is, but it's, it's got uh, names like uh, Aiken in it. Um, this I love. It's the work of Charles Babbage by R.H. Babbage, who is his descendant, who, who the, eight, the, uh, the organizers of the conference found, I think it was a postmaster or something in, in Canada. And so he came and talked about his ancestor. Um, let's see if I can spot. Oh, um, oh. Brillouin, J. Foss Forrester from MIT, who I think is credited for the development of uh, storage. And those are the names that are, oh, Richard Courant, a uh, very famous mathematician. The name that is not there is Norbert Wiener, which is what I was trying to remind myself with in uh, covering in, in the coloring earlier. And he was supposed to come, and he had an interest in this but he decided to withdraw at the last minute as a protest against the use of computing machinery, machinery for killing people in World War II. He felt very strongly that machines should not be used for that. And as I was reminded today, he's not exactly clear on the, the moral responsibility issue when you think of his contributions to signal processing and fire control. Um, but by this time, he was pretty much an anti-war activist and felt very strongly that the computing machinery industry was being taken over by the government and big industries who probably wouldn't use it properly. So as, as we'll see, this, this is a man after Berkeley's own heart. I like the list of participants. The only one I put in blue were Berkeley and Shannon because they actually met when they were there. Um, but Aiken was there, the son, Burkhoff, was there, Courant, um, Eckert, whose name we've just seen, Jay Forrester, Hamming, so known to information theorists, Grace Hopper again, Householder, whose name you may know from Householder Transformation, uh, Mokley and Harry Nyquist, another famous guy in our field, Oliver wrote the classic paper um, with Shannon on PCM, back, I think it's, it's probably 40s, probably not all the way back to the 30s. I was surprised to find Julius Stratton there. He was president at MIT during my six years there. 
Um, and I hadn't realized that he had been active in this stuff. And then, of course, Turing. It's interesting that he came over for that. Scientific American in the same year had Simon. Simon was uh, the fruition of uh, Berkeley's project to build a small computer that could be in a home. And he wrote a lot of papers in the popular science magazines and radio magazines talking about it. And I think it probably cost something like 200 bucks in, at that time. And it wasn't a very serious computer, but nonetheless, it, it was an electronic computer. And um, this was, oh, this is the date that it was published, but it's this date, 1947, when the project actually starts. So I have to track my double dating just because the picture belongs in this context. Okay, Berkeley co-founds the ACM. This had actually, well, it had been proposed that the computer machinery people, computer science wasn't really a phrase yet, get together to perform, to, to make a professional organization. And this time red is good. It just, not too many colors show up well on slides. And a founding goal was to encourage and protect communication amongst the people doing all the research. It should be open, everybody should know about it. Berkeley was definitely an idealist when it comes to research that may be of interest to the military and for industry. And the story about the opposition I've already mentioned, but I love von Neumann's <coughs> quote. Uh, I think we've all felt about the same thing when there has been too great a proliferation of professional organizations. It started off as the Eastern Association for Computing Machinery and they dropped the Eastern the second year. First meeting in 47 was 78 people and the next meeting was uh, 300. So it grew really rapidly. And if you look at some of the lists of these attendants, it's, it's a who's who of the early days of big and functional computers. 48, Berkeley left Prudential, formed his own company, uh, essentially for consulting and teaching and publishing, and it lists his favorite stuff. And now uh, what I've been leading forward to, this is stuff I think Bernadette was the first to dig up by using the Freedom of Information Act. Everybody had suspected this stuff, but you all know, or at least, um, all properly educated people will know about the House on American Activities Committee and Joe McCarthy and all the damage that it did. What you may not know is that about the same time, the military had its own committees where everything was private. You could not tell the newspapers about it. You were not told who was accusing you. You did not get to see any evidence about you. You did have to fill out a variety of forms, who, which included specific things like who do you, whom do you suspect of being a communist sympathizer. And they basically, eventually, more detail later, hounded Berkeley out of the US Naval Reserve in spite of his good service. And the letters they sent him um, were mostly based on the stuff that I've itemized in red before. And we'll summarize some of it again when we get to it. But his visiting the Soviet Union explicitly, uh, living in the Knickerbocker, and then also his attempts to promote openness in research on computers. So this doesn't really explode, explode yet. And as I mentioned, most of the history of this stuff comes out of Longo's book. All righty, um, he started, he continued talking about symbolic logic and large scale computing. We've seen that there was one little computer by a couple of unknowns that used the stuff, but it certainly wasn't widespread yet. Then Berkeley published his book. Uh, giant Brains. I have, I'm old enough to have friends who are slightly older who read that book and were profoundly influenced by it. And the idea was to explain what he called giant brains or big computers to the general public. 
Well, he said it was the general public, but there was still enough techie stuff in it, probably to discourage a lot of people. But it was a pretty good seller. And a lot of people bought it. And a lot of technical and peripheral technical people, like most people who worked in computing machinery, bought it to find out what the general views was. And he sort of developed the basic ideas in terms of Boolean algebra and symbolic logic and the underlying math. And he spent um, most of the book talking about the major machines of the time. And I think I've mentioned each one of these briefly as we went along. And you know, he was himself involved with the uh, uh, Harvard Mark computers. He had seen and visited the Bell computers. He had seen the MIT differential analyzer. He had seen the IBM punch card machines. So he was kind of a generalist of computing to write this book. And in one of the chapters, he devoted entirely to the Colin Burkhart and to Shannon. And so this was the first big publication of news about Shannon to almost the general public and definitely to the computer computing machinery. And so I guess the other thing I like to note is, well, reading about Berkeley, I've read a lot of musing about the future of computing, and the relative frequency of the name Frankenstein is pretty high, <laughs> with the point being creating something that turns on the master. Also, although I'll also say they often refer to Frankenstein rather than Frankenstein's monster. So it's, you know, Frankenstein was a, a victim as well, but small point. Um, Berkeley in 1950 had a paper extolling Shannon appearing in Science and basically lauding it for designing and checking and as uh, circuits and checking applications of symbolic logic. Um, so that again brought more of it to a general object, uh, a general population. And I just noted this one negative comment. Patterson was a pretty famous guy in symbolic, symbolic logic and in psychology where you might suspect it has applications. And he liked uh, Berkeley's thesis, but not, wasn't convinced by his arguments. So it wasn't like everybody read Berkeley and agreed with it, um, but they, they, they liked the point. They, he, he just thought he could have made a better case. This is something I on, only recently discovered, and it took a while to get some information about it. I found this book by Aiken, Burkhart, and Kalin. And of course, it made sense that Aiken and Burkhart and Kalin would work together, but Kalin and Burkhart had done their stuff as undergraduates in a symbolic logic course. And at that point, so far as I know, Aiken knew nothing about symbolic logic or cared. But by this time, a couple of years later, they're co-writing a book which is essentially about circuit design for computing machinery. So by this time, and as I found in the review, again, Alonzo Church, um, Aiken knew about Shannon, but figured he could do it better. So he didn't use the binary Boolean logic. He used something he thought he was inventing, which allowed him to have other functions involved rather than just open and closed, so he could model tubes. Well, two things. One is Church points out that his models really weren't more general. They sort of went back to earlier, less refined bool, but it was pretty much the same stuff. And as I learned from uh, Marty Cohn, just within the last week, who worked under Aiken in the Harvard laboratory, not quite that early, but very soon thereafter, Aiken was known to be absolutely obsessed with trying to find optimal representations of Boolean um, expressions and his own expressions. And he refused absolutely to consider anything but tubes. <laughs>
So he would not let his students work on transistors. He didn't think they had a future. And he cared, I think, more than most of the early computing machinery people. They wanted something that worked well and worked, period. It didn't have to be the optimal possible, simplest possible configuration. Um, that's certainly what I learned in one of my early digital classes. So uh, this, I think it tarnishes Aiken's rep, uh, reputation just a little bit, but it shows that Shannon is getting well known by the major people in the field by 51. So um, it took a while. Okay, uh, that's I think pretty much just putting into words what I said. If anybody's interested in these, by the way, I think um, either Dave will post them or I can give you a, a link if you wanna track down any of the, the, the citations at the end or the detailed quotes. Okay, 1950, Berkeley founded what was, I think undisputedly, the first computer magazine. And he had lots of the famous people writing articles and I mentioned that he also had people, science fiction writers like Fletcher Pratt and Isaac Asimov writing about the future of computing. Well, a lot of people are down on Isaac Asimov these days because he did not predict the internet, but um, he has some pretty good articles and it shows that this magazine wasn't all techie. He worried a lot about professional responsibility, as we'll see in one example here, and um, the social implications and the necessity of considering what you're working on is actually going to be used for. Um, I put in two examples, and I confess what I did is I just went online. These are all on archive.org, and I browsed through them to find somebody I knew about, just to find out how well connected he was so far as uh, an information theory and signal processor might view it. One of the first things I found was Glenn Culler, whom I knew well, and this, it, he was a winner of the uh, presidential uh, prize on technology. He developed what he called the online, others called the Color Freed system, which was one of the first time sharing systems. And I knew well a photo that looks like that, but is a few years later, when at UCSB, there are a whole bunch of students learning Fourier transforms with screens in front of them. And they're typing in stuff and it's going into an IBM 360, I think, and they're doing Fourier transforms and signal in discrete time and sampling and all of that stuff. And Color developed that along with a lot of the early ideas in the ARPANET. And you may not remember that I think one of the first three nodes of the ARPANET was UCSB. It wasn't MIT or Caltech or Illinois. Um, it was UCSB and some other relatively small places. Stanford's name was there, but only through Stanford Research Institute, not, not through Stanford. Um, the second thing is, this is probably unreadable, but I'll, I'll read you just a little. This is by the, new, the then new president of MIT, Jerome Wiesner and uh, the information revolution in the Bill of Rights. This may ring some familiar bells in current days, but I like is it that uh, uh, we're being dominated by an information Frankenstein, and it's, I'll, I will read these quotes since you probably can't. Information technology puts vastly more power into the hands of government and the private interests that have the resources to use it. There is a growing resentment and antagonism towards science and technology. There is also a widespread feeling that mankind would be better served if we could retreat to a simpler time. Now this, this is, I think, 1971 or something. And then when he's talking, oh, the 1984 could come unnoticed. Well, it did. <laughs> it came and went. Um, he's describing the surveillance and here, this was what the army was doing when it selected anti-war organizers, speakers and demonstrators for particular attention because Berkeley got wrapped up in that and he's editing this magazine. So it's, it's pretty clear he, why he, he picked Wiesner. And I like this, this is the new president of MIT, 
writing, I have wondered lately whether I am being watched as a threat, as a dangerous enemy of the realm. How do I know if I am under continuous surveillance? The answer is, I don't know. I doubt that anyone is aware of the full extent of the surveillance and information collection activities that go on in this nation. And we've, we've had a few contributions to that knowledge fairly recently, but that, that shows the, the breadth of the stuff that Berkeley was interested in. Okay, 1954. Um, Berkeley starts talking with Claude Shannon about the possibility of making small computers. And he had actually been thinking about them and had done some work with Hegelbarger to develop something like a digital signal processing lab for MIT. But he actually started consulting for Berkeley. And to, to just get ahead of myself a little bit, um, when I gave a five minute version of this talk at the unveiling of the Gaylord Shannon statue, um, I mentioned Berkeley's name and Geniac, which I'm about to talk about, she lit up like a Christmas tree. And that's the origins of this talk because she remembered this guy hounding Shannon for how to take his ideas and actually build a small computer that hobbyists could build at home and use. So he hired the right guy, I think. Um, Geniac, I never remember what its title means. Um, you can read it. But most people figured it was just to combine genius and ENIAC. Um, the idea, as typically sexist of the 50s, was to teach computers logic and sound reasoning to boys and to other students and hobbyists. It was sold through 1960 or thereabouts. He had a falling out with the guy who had helped him build the first ones who basically went bankrupt and then stole it and started selling it on his own, giving nothing to Berkeley. So he changed the name to Brainiac, um, which is a word that's had a lot of use. But so far as I know, the first one to use the word was Berkeley. And the kit, which I'll show you photos of when I go through the photos, came with wheels and bolts and wires and flash bulbs and um, did, uh, flashlight bulbs, a documentation, including a copy of Shannon's 38 thesis. Well, it was, pardon me, 38 paper based on a 37 thesis. So you can imagine how I, as a 13-year-old, took the Shannon paper, which I still have. The machine is long gone. And that is also the year when Berkeley got the word from Naval Security that he had lots of suspicious uh, security problems and he was demanded to fill out forms and to show up without benefit of a lawyer and without telling anybody that this was all happening. So he went before the Navy Security Board hearings in, um, in response to this. And this took some years because he appealed their decisions, but he eventually lost. He also became in active in the Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy. And as you probably know, the Senate considered that as a communist front organization. So this would also uh, count against him. He was getting success in his other, in his publishing areas. There was an article in Life magazine, which I will show you. And as Geniac started getting uh, published in, uh, getting sold in March, there was an ad in the Scientific American in September and I got mine in early November of that year. And I still remember it. Um, Longo is thinking of trying to put together a book of people who actually had these as kids and then became techies of some kind. So if you ever meet anybody like that, have them get in touch with me. I noted Marty Hellman got one. She was, he was less impressed by it than I was, but um, you know, he probably could have done it on his own. He was a little bit disappointed, and you know, it's, it's not a miraculous machine, but it was, it was pretty cool. Okay, the life, uh, some of the articles. Um, this was the, the Life magazine one, and this is Berkeley. He was big on small robots, as well as computing machinery. Um, I love the, the kid building the machine with the tie on. Um, 
the ads are pretty interesting too. Um, these are a couple of ads that came out for it at the time. You'll notice that it was alleged it could compose music. That was because some musician got one and actually wired it to uh, force certain, you know, chronological or certain sequences of things that actually made sense as, as melodies. And none of these are mine. These are just off the web. Um, this was the uh, full box of stuff. This was what, how I remember mine as you basically put these projects together, you turn the wheels to give it the inputs, and then the lights lit up to tell you what the outputs were. Um, this is a copy of Shannon's paper, and I put in this box just to point out this is the base of my binary arithmetic, binary Boolean algebra, um, and he proves in it in this paper that this is isomorphic to propositional logic or the special case of binary symbolic logic. Shannon did a really good job with this paper. It's, it's just amazing. Um, this is a page out of the beginner's album, beginner's manual, and I've just underlined the fact part of it's to teach you Boolean algebra. And this is about the time I think I first learned it. And here's you know, pretty much the same stuff as in Shannon's paper. Um, the contents, about a third of these projects were contributed by Shannon. I mean, the, this, this is fact. This is all known in which ones. Um, some of them were just silly. Uh, there was one for a machine to tell the difference of a female and a male uh, by asking, do you prefer fishing and hunting or <laughs> buying dresses? <laughs> so it was not a big surprise at the time. But there were some pretty nifty things in it. The one I remember best was a machine to play NIM. Now this was before NIM was really well known. Um, and I like that, I guess, because I learned about it uh, first here. Then Martin Gardner had a Scientific American article on it a couple of years later. And then last year at Marienbad came out. And a big deal was that uh, um, this guy's wife is being stolen by this guy. And throughout the movie, while there's all of this competition and interaction, they're playing Nim. And the husband who's losing his wife always wins. So everybody, including the reviewers, are asking how he can do that. Well, you know, just go read Gardner or read, read uh, Berkeley, and it, it was all laid out. This, just a personal application, that was my HO model train which had sensors in it, and thanks to Boolean algebra, was able to run two trains on it and keep the switches going correctly so they never crashed into each other. So there was a practical application. And here just to mention, DC Comics came out with a Brainiac character on the left. Berkeley, with tongue in cheek, sued. And DC backed off, changed the story a little bit, and down in the footnote is Brainiac is also a trademark registered by Berkeley Enterprises Incorporated, manufacturers of the famous Brainiac computer kit. And <laughs> that was one of those rare cases where copyright issues get settled amicably. Um, Berkeley worked with the ACM to get a socially aware uh, committee going. And about that time, he starts get a, getting accused of communist sympathies. Gardner's book, Logical Machines and Diagram, talks about Shannon and Berkeley and lots of other machines, but I don't think any of them were as, as neat as GENIAC. And he does give GENIAC a nod at actually being able to be a simple syllogism machine, not just a toy. So it got some flack. Just again, back to personal, in 59, I audited a class in uh, San Diego State College, and digital computers then full of binary, full of Boolean. Their um, textbook was by Richards, um, who was a famous IBM computer scientist, and right up at the start is Boolean algebra applied to computer components. So certainly by um, this time, it's, it's well established. I also did a science fair project in 1960, which just had diodes showing uh, basically um, 
uh, and an OR operations, and I think one transistor to do a NOT. Uh, and that was, I think that was a pretty common project in high school science fairs of the time. I also like to note that not only is Boolean algebra just binary numbers and the binary number system, it's also if you have a collection of classes or sets and uh, two operations, um, such as, uh, um, well, here, the various notations of in English as in logic and then also set theory. That is, this is really isomorphic to simple set theory. That means it sits at the basis of elementary probability theory. Can't do real probability theory because you don't have sigma fields in this. But Boolean algebra was just the right thing and not just for binary stuff like computing. Okay, the Senate denounces Sane and hence also Berkeley. Berkeley was invited to the 25th anniversary of the ACM, and he gave a talk that just fried all of those who had worked during the Vietnam War on computer machine, computing machines to kill people. So all of the military and most of the government representatives, including his friend, Grace Hopper, walked out on him. So he ended up pretty much an outcast. Just a couple of my favorite photos. Um, this is Claude Shannon and Dave Forney, and that's Tom Cover, Ted Kadota, Fred Jelinek. And the setting is in Eshkelon, Israel, and that was my wedding reception. My wife and I had been married in secret, and two people, including Lee Davison, knew about it, so they threw a surprise party. And Shannon walked in out of nowhere, and it's been said that that's why he was a bit hungover at the first Shannon lecture. <laughs> he died, Berkeley, in 1988, and I think this puts his accomplishments pretty succinctly. It's hard to say anything past that. And it's, it's sort of a good summary, but my first encounter with him was uh, around 56, and so I certainly knew him most as a teacher. And this just sort of as an epilogue in 2000, Dave organized the uh, unveiling of the Shannon statue, and um, they had a panel trying to explain Shannon to the people of Gaylord, who had not a whole lot of technical sophistication. And it was one of the best choices in my life. These guys were trying to teach them information theory and I talked about computers and binary. So I, I, I think I had, I had a, a, a better topic, and that, that was Betty back then. And most of this comes from these sources, which I'd be happy to share, and I thank you for your attention. Now we are going into the first session. We have two invited uh, keynote talks. The first speaker is uh, Ken Wise. I don't have to introduce him to yourself. And he actually studied his uh, silicon.